believe it or not. High, high in skinny jeans and his metro overseas shoes. You should actually take a look at those before you go. They're awesome. Uh, we're here for Dan's six well, year. I wore these for you. And I really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to throwing them in the hallway later. Uh, what was I saying? Dan's six year seminar for, that we're doing for full professors now. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Dan so. earned his, well, kind of earned his BS in 1989 in Earth Sciences from Miller Creek University. There's, having seen his grades, there's a high probability that he had a solid minor in drinking Rolling Rock at the same time. Yeah. He, yeah. Pennsylvania beer. <laughs> uh, in 93, he got an MS in Oceanography here at AM and a PhD in 97, State Department, and was hired the year after as a joint appointment in both. Wildlife and fisheries and oceanography. Do they pay you or are we stuck with your salary? They used to pay me. Yeah. So we're stuck with your salary. Yeah, yeah. He advanced to full professor in 2011 and has, a bunch, has uh, served on a bunch of different committees in the department. In the last six years, he's uh, had 32 peer reviewed publications and one book chapter and has brought in somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 million in various ways, and shapes, and forms. That's all I'm going to say. All right, thank you. Okay, so this, this uh, well, thank you all for being here, for one. And this picture that you've been looking at, this, uh, this picture I took in Lake Castoria, so this is in Greece, um, and they're, they're not celebrating a St. Patty's Day holiday. This is a cyanobacteria bloom going on. And, and if you guys look to the left of this image, you can start to see where the wind is blowing that cyanobacteria against the shore and causing those characteristic scums. But all that green you see in that picture, that is cyanobacteria. Um, this is Greece from two years ago, so I mean there, there is no budget to monitor this or to test for toxins. So how local officials deal with these kinds of blooms, they just tell the local citizens there's no problem. So, so, so we were there for a conference, and it was a harmful algal bloom conference, ironically. Sampled the water, uh, just chock full of species that on their best day, they are known to produce uh, low levels of toxin that cause chronic effects. Um, to all higher trophic levels. And, and for humans, uh, this, this involves um, uh, liver, uh, liver tumors from the hepatotoxins, but also neurologic uh, issues from the saxotoxins. Um, but as you can see in this picture, there's a dude fishing there, and the whole week that we were there, uh, human use was going on in this lake. So, so part of what I do is I study these kinds of harmful algal blooms, uh, but not just bloom case scenario, it's also biodiversity that you see in plankton systems. A and from these, you can learn some fundamental principles, and some of those I'm going to talk to you today. So, so I'm just going to focus on the research that my lab has published in the last six years, um, and then also on some research that is currently in review, and then one study is in a late stage of preparation. So, so I've, I've, broken those I've broken that research down into six different topics. Uh, and I want to present all of that to you because I want you to see the breadth of what my lab does. Yeah, Gary's rolling his eyes. Uh, but, but we'll go quickly through the first five topics. And I'm intentionally glassing over those because that's not where I want you guys to spend your time thinking. Rather, it's that last topic, which will be on the biodiversity sustaining mechanisms. So a, a lot of what my lab has done, in fact, um, over, it's over 30 papers now I've published on Promethium parvum. Uh, this is another harmful algal species. It's just a single cell phytoplankton. It's pretty small. Um, and when it's non-stressed and in a good mood, it's growing mostly like an autotroph. So it's getting energy from the sun, sucking up inorganic nutrients uh, with low levels of toxicity that enable it to immobilize bacteria and then it'll go and phagocytize those, those bacterial particles. But when it's stressed, it produces a lot of toxin. And that's when it, uh, those toxins get into the water, all the competing algae lice. It comes along and phagocytizes all the exploded particles as well as absorbs the guts of those cells that have exploded. So think about that. This is an organism that's capable of autotrophy, uh, phagotrophy, and it's also saprophytic. So this is a very uh, diverse organism that can compete in lots of different environments. Uh, the fish kills, in my opinion, then that's just a side effect of, of what Parvum's doing to try to get alternative sources of nutrition. So, so, so a lot of these chemicals, they react with fine membranes, cause them to deteriorate, pokes holes in them. So if you're a gill-breathing organism, you're screwed because you're going to die. Um, and, and normally these fish kills will happen within two hours or so once a fish gets into a bloom.
And it's non-selective. It doesn't matter what kind of fish you are. So, so we're searching my lab on par from started in 2003, and it's been ongoing uh, to present. So it makes sense over these past six years or so that that has been a time to start uh, publishing some review papers. Uh, and, and that's what is listed here on the right. Uh, the content of what went into those papers, much of it was produced by these guys. So, so these are all of the uh, technicians, master students, PhDs, and postdocs that have cycled through my lab um, who have worked on Primnesium parvum. And three of them are extant. So, so uh, Rick, Sierra, and Meg are all working on parvum issues in my lab. And, and they're all answering a very basic question, and that's why do we see parvum in this location and not in that location? Why do we see parvum at this time and not at that time? There's nuances to their uh, questions that they're asking, and they're all here, so you can, you can ask them when you see them more specifics about what they're doing. But, but I'm going to get now and talk a little bit about P parvum management. So this, uh, in the early stages of our research, we did a lot of monitoring, so, and it was in multiple lakes. And we would normally launch out of a cove. And this was one particular morning. We're on Whitney. We're on the boat. We're heading out of cove. And we are just seeing schools comprised of fishes, multi-species schools, just coming into the cove. All of these fish sort of half dazed, but they're coming into the coves. Um, and as, we, as the boat went out into the main part of the lake, we got into the bloom. And, and then right at the front, you saw the fish that were too disoriented to escape. And then as you got further into it, there's dead fish everywhere. So, so we sampled the rest of that day. Uh, we came back into this cove at the end of the day. Um, and all those fish that had escaped the bloom in the morning were dead because the, the bloom had propagated into the cove. So that got us thinking, well, you know, management on a lake-wide level is likely not possible. But what might be possible is management at a cove level, where the idea is that you create refuge habitat for fish to uh, escape the bloom and then hopefully accelerate a recovery of fisheries after the bloom subsides. So, so from our monitoring, we knew that hydraulic flushing and inflow events were super important at terminating blooms. So we did in-field experiments, we did uh, dye tracer experiments, and we did numerical modeling to explore that further. Um, and, and I just got to tell you guys that if you ever want to meet locals quickly, this is how you do it. You put dye in their water. <laughs> they come out of the woodworks to ask you what you're doing. But, but we did all of that field work to calibrate and validate a model where the idea was is here you have the main stem of a lake. You have a model component there. And then you have a cove. You have another model component. And the idea is that you take deep water from the lake and pump it into the cove. So, so the deep water from the lake is, uh, doesn't have parvum cells in it. Um, and by doing that, you can artificially create inflow events that when you scale that up to a lake, they certainly can terminate blooms. But we want to see if you can terminate blooms in coves. And this is the kind of research products that we were producing. So, so, so this work was being done for Brazos River Authority and then for US Army Corps of Engineers. But basically, we took uh, pumps that were commercially available so that they could do a cost analysis to see if they wanted to pursue this. But we did scenarios where there are one, two, and three pumps. And then we had the pumps turned on either one, two, three, or five, or seven days out of a week. Um, and then we looked at different exchange rates. Depending on what the wind speed is, you have the different water exchange rates between the open lake and a cove. And then you can predict what the percent reduction of the bloom would be. So this kind of information was very useful for them because they could tell right off the bat that trying to save money by only having the pumps on one, two, or three days, that ain't going to work. They're going to have to have pumps on five to seven days, and likely they're going to need three pumps. So, so this way they can do a cost-benefit analysis. Is it worth putting in the infrastructure to do uh, to get an 80% reduction in the bloom. Is it worth it to accelerate recovery of fisheries in, those, in that regard? Uh, but it was not all about hydraulic flushing. We, we also um, proposed putting acid out in coves too, but not to make acidic conditions, just to make neutral conditions. But we did those experiments. And then we also explored ammonia pulses. Uh, both of those work great for controlling parvum. Um, and then we also explored uh, flumioxazine at the time was uh, a, a chemical that had been recently approved by EPA to be used as a, an, an aquatic herbicide. That, that's the active ingredient in Clipper. Uh, so we also did experiments that explored um, what that, that effect would be. And that also works really well, uh, but that would be an expensive solution. 
We explored some biological control mechanisms. So one of the ideas that we had is because you, you never co-observe cyanobacteria and parvum, that, that perhaps the two chemically interact and that cyanobacteria could be used to suppress parvum. So we did those experiments and, and got like the exact opposite result where cyanobacteria actually stimulated the parvum. But we did see something exciting with rotifers. So, so um, yeah, I forgot to mention early on, so parvum doesn't just kill its competing algae, it kills its predators too. So, so the, the zooplankton that would normally feed on it, uh, they die and then parvum attaches to them and absorbs their guts as they decay. Uh, but not all zooplankton. So from our field monitoring, we saw that there seemed to be some taxa that could eat parvum while it was toxic. So we did more focused experiments, and, and these were all rotifers. And indeed, it does look like rotifers uh, can exert a measure of top-down control on parvum even while it's toxic. I, I had to publish some stuff on doom and gloom um, issues. So in, in, in our area, we're predicted to have up to a 60% 60, 60 reduction in overland flow. Um, and, and the mechanisms behind this are increased human population as well as climate change in our region. So, so the doom and gloom thing that I did is I looked at a 10-year period um, in three different lake systems, and, and I calculated the characteristics of inflow events that were large enough to terminate a bloom. Um, and, and in that historical condition, like for example for Possum Kingdom, there were 42 such events and they lasted for however many number of days. And then I just re-ran that analysis at different flow reduction levels. And you can see that if we indeed do have a 60% reduction, we're completely screwed. Look at it, we're going from a 42 bloom, termina bloom terminating events down to 19. Um, so, so, so that does not, uh, our reduction in overland flow in Central Texas did not at all bode well. Uh, for the incidence of parvin blooms. Well, bodes well for the blooms, not for us who have to deal with them. And another concern that we have is, uh, you know, so, so Houston has big time water shortages and that's only predicted to get worse. One of the solutions to that is to do an interbasin transfer, pump water from the lower Brazos into the bayous uh, of the lower San Jacinto Basin. That could be problematic because the Brazos is where the parvum is and you're talking about introducing parvum into a bayou system that drains into Galveston Bay, where, where there's a, a fishery there. I don't know, the fishery production there is, I think, a 150 million a year or something is what it produces. Um, so, so we also did experiments there to take uh, sandwiches from Galveston Bay and just see how, how would they respond to an introduction with parvum. So, so any, anytime one of these bars is above 10 million cells per liter, that's bloom proportions, and that's the cell concentrations where fish start dying. So at all these different size fractions, it's not until you have included the very largest of the zooplankton do you start to see any sort of control on parvum. Um, so this, this is a real threat to Galveston Bay, and it's something that needs to be considered in the state water plan. Now, moving away from parvum, um, so, so we've done other work that deals with inflows. And in sticking with Galveston Bay, that, that's a neat system because you have two major rivers dumping into it. You have the San Jacinto and the Trinity. Um, and everyone wants to be able to predict what's going to happen to a system when you have reduced flows, or, or increased flows for that matter. Uh, Galveston, Galveston is a bit complex because when you uh, have higher flows coming down the sand jack, you actually stimulate productivity. Um, you have higher flows coming down the Trinity and you reduce productivity. So, so you have these, these opposing and co-occurring effects of inflow depending on which watershed that, that uh, flow is coming into it. And we followed over time how productivity has changed as well as diversity at an aggregated taxonomic level. And you get a relationship like this that is not at all expected. So, so normally you think of when you increase productivity, you also incre increase uh, species richness or said reverse, if you increase richness, you increase productivity. That's not the case uh, for the data that we have at Galveston. So it's, it's at those lowest productivity levels that's where you can see really low diversity or super high diversity. When productivity is high, you see an intermediate level of diversity. Um, all of that, though, you have to take with a grain of salt because it's all based on fixed station sampling, and that, that's a hard thing to extrapolate to a liquid environment that's moving around. So I've been working with uh, some folks over in um, uh, civil engineering to develop remote sensing algorithms that are good for type two waters in Galveston Bay, and those are some of the maps that we've produced. 
We are seeing it. So this one I'll slow down just a little bit more on because because uh, it was pretty tedious. So we're, we're doing similar things in the San Antonio and uh, uh, Copano Aransas Bay system. This this system is of particular importance because the whooping cranes come here in the winter time, um, and while they're here, they're primarily feeding on blue crabs and wolfberry. So. Folks are very interested in how inflows might influence the salinity and nutrient and productivity environment because the blue crabs and the wolfberry are dependent upon it. So in this case, we're working with the Texas Water Development Board. That they run their text blend model, which gives us really nice uh, detailed uh, circulation vectors. This is a, a time of low flow. This is what it looks like when you have high flow. Um, for our model domain, we divvy this up into six areas. We did that because that's where we would have enough available data for the model calibration validation process. Um, but that's what our model domain looked like. We dropped down into that a multi-species, multi-nutrient model, and we produced products that look like this. So the, probably you can't see the dots from the back, but, but and the, everywhere where you have dots, those are the data records that they go back uh, 20 plus years. Uh, the solid line is our model prediction. And you can see we're really good at, at um, predicting productivity. And we're like spot on with dissolved oxygen. So that's, this is the productivity. It's, that's DO. So once you have that, you can produce a product. And, and, and in this case, this is uh, work that we, we did for TCEQ. So here we can look at how um, inflows, how they might change, and how nutrient loading might change. And in turn, how will that influence the annualized productivity, as well as the, uh, the dissolved oxygen minima. And, I, and with inflows, I've had the opportunity of working with other groups who work in black water systems. So the Australian group that I work with, this is in the Bega River estuary. Very cool in that in this system, it's, it's just not apparent where the primary productivity is coming from, but yet they're, it's super productive. But here, we're able to trace the dissolved organic matter. So, so the allochthonous carbon coming into the system, we could trace that up through the zooplankton and into fish. Um, so in, in this case, you have a food web that's being supported uh, by heterotrophs, not autotrophs. Same thing in wine millers um, sampling site in, in Sinaruco. That, that work we did in the, the mid-2000s, but the capstone paper that came out describing that came out in 2014. Same type deal, except for here you have a, a major subsidy going on with migratory fish. No one's going to comment on the fishing pictures there? <laughs> I don't think you caught that. <laughs> I can only say pictures don't lie. And then I'm doing lots of fun work with, with the Greeks. So, so here it's not on inflows, but it's dealing with um, meta communities. So we're really interested in uh, how the rate of migration influences biodiversity. So here we take assemblages from the Aegean Sea, bring them back to the lab. Uh, allow them to self-organize under different conditions, and then once they come to a stable state, we initiate a mixing experiment, which is a meta-community experiment. Um, and we're duplicating the work that we've done from assemblages from the aging in the lab. We're doing it in these salt production facilities, which is super cool. So, so a salt production facility, you have a bunch of ponds. You circulate water through it. The idea is you want those ponds to come to steady state because it's a purification that goes on. And you keep circulating. It gets saltier and saltier. And by the end, you just have salt. The reason why this is so good is because there are multiple tracks that the water flows through. So if you take a low salinity track, you can find ponds that are at near steady state. And then you can initiate meta-community experiments using those. So that's been lots of fun, too. And then I had some opportunity to do some miscellaneous stuff. So, so with uh, Angela Whitmer, she was a PhD student of Mary Wixton's. She took my 611 class, and her and I started talking about her work on beach communities. And she got lucky in that her sample sites were just mowed over by Hurricane Ike. So, so that was an opportunity to look at before after effects. And there, it was great, because beaches uh, that weren't drived on recovered very quickly. But the ones that were drived on just did not recover at all. And we showed that nicely in her paper. And then Joy Deb, those of you who got to know Joy Deb will know that he is a remarkable intellect. And uh, he was paid to do the uh, SABS CABS work that I showed you earlier, which just was barely challenging to him. <laughs> so I was like, keep throwing him additional projects. And two of those were lionfish-oriented projects. Uh, the, one, the one paper that we have in review is looking at um, intermittent harvesting strategies to try to control lionfish. And the other one is using the Trojan Y chromosome approach uh, to control lionfish. Now, OK, so that, that, was the, uh, that was the fast part. So now I want to slow down. Um, you're like, oh my god, he's going to slow down. <laughs> 
So we've all worked in uh, biodiverse systems. And I think for most of us, that captivates us, right? It's the kind of stuff that you, you wake up at night thinking, oh, why was that so diverse? Um, and in plankton systems, I mean, that's like the model, diverse system. So, so for example, in, in uh, Lake Somerville, I, I've already uh, quantified, you know, through using microscopy, 80 species in a single drop of water. So it is really hard to envision 80 niches in a drop of water, yet they're there. Um, and, and it's not something that I've just been perplexed about. I mean, this goes all the way back to Hutchinson, and Hutchinson, of course, proposed it in the paradox of the plankton. Um, and then it's been nicely solved. So if, if you assumed that available resources to an organism can instantaneously relate to that organism's growth rate, that then you can accept the Minot equation. So this is, this is widely used in uh, anyone working with autotrophs, so whether it's plants or algae. In a chemostat framework, so, so these are what these boxes are that you guys see up in my lab. In a chemostat framework, you have growth of the organism because nutrients are being supplied, but then they have a loss factor because they're being flushed out. But you grow that thing up to steady state, you can set that equation equal to zero, solve it for S, and then redefine S as R star, and this is what you get. And then you can use that R star to, divine, to, do, to find the zero net isoclines for that particular species, and then you can also determine it, uh, use it to determine what the optimal resource ratio is for that species, for a single species. You can then use the same approach with multiple species, and now you can define uh, resource ratios in a system where you will have competitive exclusion and where you'll have coexistence. Um, so this, this is the work that David Tillman did in the mid-1970s, um, and then he like just crystallized it in his 1982 book, and this is what landed him in the National Academy of Sciences. It's, it's super elegant, simplistic, and very powerful at describing uh, variability that you see in natural systems. So, if you're working in a plant world, this gradient is very easy to visualize spatially, right? Because land's not flat. There's hills. There's precipitation gradients. There's light gradients. You've got all kinds of gradients. So it's easy to see how you can have species start to partition that resource gradient and have some very fine distribution in niches. If you're looking at a drop of water, um, it's di more difficult to see those. So instead, you don't look at a spatial niche, you look at temporal changes. So now if you have a fluctuating environment, and if that fluctuation periodicity is at the right frequency, you can maintain many, many species. So that's the theoretical part. And that's, that's um, I mean, that's what all my, I don't want to say training, because no one ever trained me with that stuff. I just read a crap ton of stuff and figured that out. Um, but, but that's my entire life from a student to now, that was my approach to looking at succession dynamics and trying to explain biodiversity. But there are other mechanisms. So, so you guys all know Hubble's uh, neutrality idea. So, so this is when you have exclusion rates between species, it's just that they're like glacially slow. So, so relative to ecological time, they're inconsequential. So you can then view species as being competitive, competitive equivalents. So in that case then, the distribution of species is just described by the stochastic events that affect dispersal, and then stochastic events that might affect uh, local extinctions when populations are at low density. And that's it. So, so, so neutrality flies directly in the face of niche theory. I mean, they are diametrically opposed. Um, but there's a, a different theory out there that reconciles the two, and that's what's called lumpy coexistence. So, so lumpy coexistence is the idea where along a resource gradient, species will self-organize into clumps, where we're within a clump, species are self-similar, uh, but between clumps, they're pretty different. So what that means in terms of neutrality, if, if you're in a clump and you've got neighbors in your clump, you're neutral. Um, but if you're looking at somebody who's in the clump on the other side, uh, you're not neutral. You are very competitive with that other clump, and that's where niche theory governs it. If you are an invader, and you're invading into a clump, chances are you're going to be a successful invader. If you're an invader and you arrive in the gap between clumps, you have no chance of having a successful invasion because the competition against you will be so steep. Um, and, then, and then the third mechanism is the idea of intransitivity. So, so this, is, this is where you have uh, a single species or an assemblage of species, we'll call it B, and they're able to outcompete 
species A or assemblage A. But then B gets outcompeted by C, and then C gets outcompeted by A. If you have that kind of environment, you have a succession to name it that goes A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and it keeps repeating. And when that happens, you can have very high diversity in the system. So that, that's the rock, paper, scissors. And if you do a literature search into rock, paper, scissors in the ISI database, you find lots of papers. So it's, that's a scientific term. Did you guys know that? So what I want to do is look at how neutrality, lumpy coexistence, and intransitivity, how do they function in plankton systems? The work that I did before this six-year period didn't bode well for those three theories. So I was using spatially simplistic models, and I would get them to mix, and my diversity just kept collapsing. So from my earlier work, I was thinking, well, better stick with the fluctuation stuff that Tillman worked out, because that works. This other stuff is not working. Um, but, but enter Joy Dead and Francis. So the work that they did, they're looking at spatial systems that are more complex. And because they're more complex, that allows the possibility that source sink patches can develop. The stuff that I did earlier were too simplistic, and there was no chance for sources or sinks to develop. So with JoyDev, he did a one-dimensional model. Imagine flow coming in two ends of a pipe. It hits in the middle point and exits out. But then he also did a two-dimensional model. So imagine two eddies side by side uh, circulating. So Joy Deb put those two models together. Um, within with, within the, the two eddy framework, so imagine an assemblage gets dropped at A and another at B. And, and what we're looking for is uh, under what hydrologic conditions do those two source patches maintain their identity. Um, and similarly with the pipe model, the, the two uh, source assemblages are on either end of it. So we needed a way to standardize how we looked at it, because he, he did a crap ton of simulations. Um, and what we came up with is that if you took the first derivative of the diversity change, we could use that timing, whenever that occurs in the model, as the point when a local assemblage was beginning to lose its integrity because of the arrival of invaders. So, so in this lower graph, the, the solid line there, those are showing the resident species. The dashed line are the arriving invaders. This is the diversity of the system. So in this case, at 213 days, you'd say, the local assemblage is becoming compromised. Um, whether or not this is true or not actually doesn't matter. What's important is that we consistently use this tool across all simulations to do our comparisons. Sorry, guys, this one's small. So, so this is a representative neutral lumpy and intransitive. Um, and what you can see is that the, the lumpy, the time takes a little longer uh, relative to the neutral, and that the intransitive, it's a bit shorter. And then you can create these surface plots. So, so these are the uh, different hydraulic dilutions, and these are the different advection rates. This is in the, the pipe configuration of the model. Um, I don't particularly want to get into the nuances of the curves with you guys, but I want you to see that the intransitive surfaces are the lowest. So that means they are the most sensitive compared to uh, lumpy and neutral assemblages. And then in, in the two eddy version of the model, same deal. So neutral, uh, lumpy, and intransitive. And intransitive is super low. So the, the work that Joy Deb was doing was suggesting that intransitivity is not likely going to be happening in aquatic environments. And then enter Frances. Um, she's looking at a, a one-dimensional water column. And when you do that, then all of the cool things that happen in limnology and oceanography can be incorporated into your model. So these things involve light gradients. They involve uh, uh, changes in sinking rate, changes in vertical mixing. You still have uh, hydraulic displacements at different depths. And you can put in rescue effects from offshore waters. Um, I won't get into her results because they're a bit complex, but, but they were similar to Joy Debs, where the intransitive assemblages were the least likely to maintain their identity. So things were not voting well for intransitive assemblages. And then and Erika, so she takes these models and she adds allelopathy to them. So now we're, we're linking the biodiversity stuff with the harmful algal bloom stuff. Uh, and then what we vary in the model is how sensitive the target species are to the toxin and how quickly can the allelopathic species produce the allelochemical. So everywhere where you see a dark blue, uh, that means that you had a monospecific bloom of the allelopathic species. So, so you had a harmful algal bloom. Um, everywhere you don't, that meant that some of the residents were able to survive. And there are differences that you see. So this is, uh, this is a neutral, this is uh, lumpy, and this is intransitive. 
Um, for our purposes here, just look at the slope of these things. So you can see the slope gets steeper as you move down to the intransitive. There are fewer pixels that are blue. So that means there are fewer incidences where you can have an allelopathic bloom, which means that those assemblages are more resistant to allelopathic bloom takeover. And if you plot those out, so you do a whole bunch of runs, um, all of the, um, the non-filled symbols, those are intransitive assemblages. These middle squares are the lumpy ones, and here are the, the, uh, the neutral ones are to the far left. On the x-axis, we made up our own measure of, uh, of dissimilarity that compared the allele chemical producing species to all the rest of the assemblage. And then the slope of those lines is on the y-axis. But what this shows you is that neutral are pretty darn sensitive. Uh, lumpy are in the middle, and that intransitive are, are resistant. So that's awesome, because this is the case that is for intransitivity. What's, of all the modeling stuff that we've done, this is the only modeling approach that shows that intransitive assemblages might occur in plankton environments. Uh, but, but Rick went on, and um, we got some field data from eight different lakes where we were able to get the total biomass of the allelopathic species as well as the size spectrum so, so that we could look at, uh, measure a degree of lumpiness in those systems. And this was pretty cool. All, all of the systems that are plagued by allelopathic species, blooms of allelopathic species had fewer lumps. The ones that aren't had more lumps. So, so in this case, the empirical data was strongly supporting the modeling data. Now to tie that with fluctuating environments. So, so in this case, so, so all, all these little dots, those are the uh, species that are in the initial assemblage that self-organize into some sort of uh, an assemblage. And then the dark uh, arrow is resources fluctuating. And how quickly they fluctuate matters. So if they fluctuate quickly, uh, you see a dynamic like this where you have two succession patterns that are distinct from each other. And that's the case that we see in lakes and estuaries. There's typically a winter through spring succession pattern that is distinct. And then there's a second one that goes summer through the fall. So this, this emergent behavior in the model is consistent with real world data in plankton systems. If you slow this fluctuation down so it becomes gradual, you get this sort of mirror image succession. That hasn't been documented in plankton systems. But I think it's because no one's looked for it. It has been document, documented in flowering plant systems and the insects that are dependent on those flowering plants. But we tested this model with a whole bunch of different scenarios. Uh, th these were the different response variables. Uh, that first one made sense. So, so when you increase complementarity, meaning this downward uh, curve becomes more pronounced, you would get more biomass. That makes sense, right? If species are more complementary to each other using resources, you expect more biomass. Um, but we got less overyielding, which uh, is completely counterintuitive. So, but it can easily be explained when you, within the framework of this model. So, so imagine now uh, three different assemblages of varying com uh, complementarities that have self-organized. So the assemblage along the red line, those would be the least complementary, because there's just a linear line. And then the ones along this green line have the highest level of complementary, and then the blue line would be the intermediate level of complementarity. Um, so you can see right off that the highest level of complementarity are the ones that have the lowest R star values. So of course they're going to have the highest biomass. It's defined that way, right? So that's not surprising. But what is surprising is where the overyielding thing comes in. So look, look at all of the low complementarity intermediate species. The, those numbers beside those dots, that's how well the species performs when it's in a monoculture. And these numbers are, I mean, they're, they're you know, 5.3, 5.2. Compare those with the high complementarity where those numbers are in the upper 20s. Huge differences. And that explains the difference in the overyielding. So, so, so overyielding is a measure of polyculture performance divided by the mean monoculture performance. If your monocultures all do crappy, of course you're going to have high overyielding. So in this case, this is actually kind of showing the danger of how to interpret a measure of overyielding. Because here, overyielding is higher not because the system is producing more biomass, but because the monocultures do really crappy when they're isolated. Oh, um, but that was cool. But the other thing that was jumping out is look at these clumps that form, right? You see that at multiple levels of complementarity. 
And if you look at that differently, this is, um, so this is a 360 day periodicity in the model and these are the number of cycles. Here you see the emergence of clumps, right? So, so, so the other, the graph I just showed you, you can see that they're there, but this is showing them a bit more robustly. And at different periodicities of fluctuations, you still see clump emergence, but they're in different locations, so different, different numbers of clumps. And it's only when you get to 15-day uh, periodicity that you lose the clumps, that you just have survivors on either extreme of the resource gradient. And how robust is this? So in this upper panel, these are all the different periodicities that we explored. Um, and you can see that the position of the clumps changes depending on the periodicity, um, but it's still clumpy. And then you can change the phase difference between when nutrients are loaded, and that changes where the, the location of where the clumps will occur along the resource gradient, but it's still, it's still lumpy. And then you can also uh, change the peak amplitude. So instead of big peaks in nutrient pulses, those peaks can become small. And again, that changes the position of the clumps, but it is still clumpy. And now this is the cool part of this work. So if, if, if you, um, so you have your resource gradient. If you just take two species on either end of the resource gradient, um, and you, and this is you know, using the Tillman you know, resource ratio framework, what that trajectory is is the nutrients, how nutrients change through time, and you see that characteristic figure eight. Um, if you take two species, instead of from the extreme, you just take them a little bit in on the resource gradient, this is where you get the cool butterfly. Uh, looking shape, and this is what Steve Lorenz did his, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, does it, are there tornadoes in Texas thing? That's where that's coming from. Um, if, if you add all those together, you still get the butterfly, but the shape of the wing is, is subtly changed. Um, but if you allow the model to self-organize, so you're not cherry-picking species, you get this complex pattern. In, in the resource ratio. And, and, and everywhere where the arrows are closer together, uh, the model is spending more time at those resource ratios. And what you can see is where all those little arrows are, are, are clustered, those happen to be in the regions of the surviving species that, that self-organized. I mean, they're, they're near to the optimal resource ratios of the surviving species. So now what was interesting about this is that the self-organized assemblage emerged after about 40 to 50 cycles. It was there. There might be subtle changes in it, but it was there. This pattern in the resource ratio, this emerged like after the second and third cycle. So this happens quickly, and we don't know why <laughs> just yet. So, so clearly this pattern then dictates what the final structure is going to be, but why this pattern emerges before the actual assembly starts to structure itself is still a mystery. So, so, so this part of it, we got published, but there's clearly more work to keep going on that. And then, and then I can't help myself, so I have to make the model a little bit more complex. So here I'm adding uh, self-shading grazing and pathogens individually, and then all combinations of them. And this is with the sudden uh, changes in the resource uh, fluctuation. So what you can see is that same succession pattern where it's back-to-back -back succession, but way more species now. So this is way more representative of what you would see in a natural environment. Uh, but look at what happens when, uh, when these fluctuations become gradual. <laughs> you get this. So, so it, if you were sampling a system that was being governed by these dynamics, you would just say it was chaotic. I mean, there's no way your sampling technique would be able to resolve patterns like this. Each color is a different species, right? Um, which that brings me back then to the 80 species in a single drop of water. So, so you could imagine trying to explain that if these are the governing dynamics in your system. And then again, we just can't help ourselves. So we wanted to look at then what would happen with extinction. So we wanted to, so, so these are self-organized assemblages. So what's the game called? Is it Jenga? Or you, yeah, which is imagine your Jenga thing is built up, right? So this is your assembly structure that's self-organized. Well, it's caused an extinction by pulling a block out. Um, but it's not just a single species, right? There's a cascade then that falls after that. So what, what we did here is we would cause a single species extinction, let the model re-self-organize with all the cascading extinctions that would go on until it came to a new steady state. 
And then what we plotted out was the richness versus how efficiently you could use a resource. So all those black diamonds, that those are the, the, the um, assemblages that are still intact. So we haven't caused an extinction yet. And the, the relationship between richness and resource use efficiency, it's flat. There is no relationship. Um, but if you have compromised assemblages that have experienced cascade extinctions, that's when you get this slope. And it has long perplexed uh, limnologists and oceanographers why you see variance in this particular biodiversity ecosystem function. And this is the first time that a mechanism is being shown that explains that. So we're excited about that, too. Um, and then the last thing, that model lends itself really nicely to the private sector. Um, so so you, cause, cause you can quickly change it to become an a algal reactor. So, so in this case, I was working with people at uh, Algae Journal. And, uh, and I was showing them how they could change the periodicity in which they harvest and the nutrient loading uh, to increase the stability in their productivity over time. But that came at a cost of sacrificing what their total productivity could be. Um, so, so, so if you're an algal production uh, owner, you want as much biomass produced in as short a time as possible. Um, but if you have an infection that affects your reactor, you're down for months till you get it back up and running again. So it's a game that you play in this industry with stabilizing your production versus the amount of production. And this model nicely provides a tool for doing that. So with my concluding thoughts, um, you know, I, 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 I've become a big fan of models that self-organize and then uh, doing experiments with them. Um, and it's easy to become a fan of that now because computational power enables that. Uh, fairly nicely. But when you do that, uh, the whole argument that ecologists have between niche and neutral theories, it, it, that goes away, right? Because if you self-organize, now it becomes a game of what are your assembly rules and what are your environmental conditions um, that are being applied during the process of self-organization. Because you, you can bring about both neutral and lumpy assemblages when you do that. Um, in my mind, I think the idea of lumpy coexistence should actually become our default framework of understanding. I don't think classic niche theory that's taught in every ecology book should be the default. I think this is a better one. Um, and then the last thing, I always talk about this at conferences, and, and I just get nothing but blank looks. Um, and, and the reason why is because I think it's daunting. Um, when people study complex systems, they tend to measure what they can, and then that's what they report on. But there's no a priori effort to ask, well, what level of complexity do I actually need to sample for to capture the variability in this system? And what I hope to show with the models is that just by adding one or two more processes, you get wildly different results. So there needs to be thought that goes into our monitoring and our management efforts as to the roles of nutrient self-shading, allelopathy, preferential grazing, taxon-specific uh, you know, allelopathic interactions, all, all of these things. Um, before you can really figure out what sort of monitoring that you want to do. And then the last thing I want to acknowledge the people over the past six years who I've been very close to. We always need good colleagues to be productive, uh, and these are the people that I've been very productive with, and then they also are very good friends. So with that, I will take any questions. And I like the way you've uh, incorporated complexity with spatial and, and temporal components entering each lens. But uh, having said that, it seems it's all a bottom up focus on dynamics. So I wonder what would happen if you had another trophic level or two. I mean, they're complex enough already mm -hmm. to get that. But you had, because uh, we know like in Northern Lakes, carpenters work and all that, that you can have significant top down mm -hmm. this, um, all the way to phytoplankton. Yeah. Ah, you mean the beyond zooplankton. Mm -hmm. Okay, but because, well, because it is, we do have. Let's just say zooplankton. Okay, but there you go. The, the, the zooplankton are in oh, this. Any, yeah, yeah, with the, yeah this, is, this is the differential grazing losses. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So but, but you're right, though. The resource ratio model doesn't have, have that. So, so the two kinds of models that I was showing you, you're, you're correct. So um, the really nice complex ones that were showing the uh, self-organization of lumpies, uh, of lumpy coexistence, uh, th those were 
competition for resources, fluctuating environments. That was it. Um, and then to that, I overlaid these things. So, so, so I, I haven't explored how grazing and pathogens are influencing, or self-shading for that matter, are influencing the distribution of clumps. That would be fun to do. Um, you can't tell from the equation, so, so, so I, I do have zooplankton effects in here, but in a really lame way. So, so zooplankton are not state variables in this model. So, so their pressure is just being applied as some proportion of the prey availability. So what you're saying is correct in that uh, grazers should become a dynamic variable and that'll change these dynamics, as well as the grazer stoichiometry will influence the nutrient stoichiometry, which in turn will influence the phytoplankton. I haven't done that stuff yet, but you're right that that effect would be there, and then fish would have another layer of effect on that. That would be hard to do. Uh, it, it wouldn't be hard to implement the model, but uh, the, the, the results, I don't know if they would be tractable. Maybe already contemplated this, but I'm just wondering how they come off a model like this can be when you move from one system to another. I mean, it's where yeah. water conditions change. Yeah. And you have so much variation in what you can find. We didn't, yes, yeah, so, so I didn't get to talk much about the work that we did, uh, I did with Joy Deb and Sab's cabs. Um, so, so there, we did an optimization routine where we start uh, with you know, species-rich pools, and it's, it's being uh, defined with different life history traits, and then the model runs over and over and over again, and then we're doing an R-squared fit to the field data, and, and we're finding what combinations of life history traits best match that, and, and, and then after we get that, it's still a pretty piss-poor match, but then we add in temperature effects, and then we add in self-shading, and then we add in differential sinking. So, so we have created um, an optimization procedure that will allow you to take this model and tailor it to your system. Um, and, and then I should say the order in which we optimize those different processes, we then change that around. And, and then, so it normally takes like a week for a computer to do it, but then it'll find the best parameterization. And then the validation stuff that I showed you real quick there, but that's what that was based on. So, so that was funded by uh, TCEQ, they loved it. Um, what they want us to do now is develop a GUI so, so that people who are not modelers would be able to get that model to optimize itself for their own particular system. So that's where we're at with that. But what you're saying is right, because it'll change from system to system. I had a question back to the golden algae. I know uh, based on some of your work and others in fish hatcheries are using surface water that may be Contaminated with golden algae, you can add amendments to basically prevent the golden yeah. algae from occurring. Um, but with regard to some of these um, reservoirs like Granberry and PK, have, have they had any occurrences in recent no. years? It seems like that's not been in the news at least. Oh, oh well, why don't there's been blooms? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so it was from 2001 to 2007 is where the really big lake wide blooms were that went all the way from PK down through Whitney. Um, and then 2007 was a really wet year, so, 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 so that lowered conductivity all over the place. Um, and since 2007, we still have golden algae blooms, but they're, they're more isolated, so, so they're not system-wide. So it hasn't gone away, it's still there. Um, what state hatcheries have done is that they've adopted a process where they're adding, um, it's ammonia pulses, but it's coupled to one of their copper-based uh, herbicides as well. And that causes a fish mortality uh, but they can live with that fish mortality because they still get some fish at the end of the day by controlling parvum. Um, and that's what they do when parvum flares up. So, so if they're bringing in water from a lake during the time there's no parvum, they don't do anything. If they see parvum, they start doing this copper ammonia combination. Um, and that seems to be working for them. Uh, that, that's, well, you know, it's expensive. So, so to do that at the level of a cove, I, I, I don't think, it, I mean, it's doable, but it costs a lot of money. Um, for me, by far and away, the best management approach to parvum if you're trying to manage coves is to add acid to the coves. But of course, no one wants to do that. So all the, all the populace of these lakes, they were all raised at the time of acid rain, knocks and socks. So if you even mention acid to them, it, it's, it's, a, it's a no starter, right? Um, but, so that's a task, and maybe I need to work with extension on that, because there needs to be a dialogue where you're letting them know the acid is added slowly and we never create acidic conditions. Uh, the reason why that's the best approach is because the 
the, some of the toxic chemicals produced by parvum, if you lower the pH, it changes its ionization state to a completely harmless form. Um, and, and parvum is a lousy competitor. So with, without its toxins, it quickly gets eaten by other stuff and it's gone. Um, and, and we showed that in our experiments. That, I mean, that, that effect happens like within a day. Um, so that, that would be a nice way to do it, but there's a lot of uh, social barriers to overcome. And I know it likes uh, brackish water. What is like the upper limit in terms of this? Yeah, this organism is incredible. So, so it'll grow all the way up to 35 parts per thousand, so full strength seawater. Um, and it'll, it'll bloom um, at salinities down around three or so, but it can still grow at salinities even less than that. So, I mean, big time urehaline. Um, it likes uh, 22 parts per thousand at its best. But, but with this organism, when it's growing at its best, it's not stressed and it's not producing the toxin. So it ends up just sort of being a part of the hidden flora. It's when you get to the extremes of its niche. So when it's sitting at the edge of its niche, that's when it is stressed, and that's when toxin production goes up. Yeah. But it's an issue that I, I wish I could get uh, coastal people to talk about. So there's just the one bloom in the Matagorda Bay system. So you guys heard Rika talk about that when she defended. Uh, but other than that, it hasn't bloomed on the Texas coast. And you know, to get people to think in a proactive mindset is like near impossible. So I, I mean, they, they probably need to see a big bloom happen in one of our major bays. And then there'll be a willingness to look at the issue. Um, you know, you said like, well, there can be 80 species in a drop of water, uh -huh. but there's a whole other, you know, big literature and community ecology, like where did those species come from? And so, you know, a, a lot of this literature talks about disentangling the roles of history, you know, through phylogenetic analysis and relationships among species, you know, in combination with local processes. So, you know, if there's that many species, you know, are they, you know, are the models saying they're all competing with each other equally? <clears throat> or is there room for species that are not competing? Or is all this species packing? Is it with species that are more closely related to each other? And that sort of thing. Okay, so to the first part of your question, let me say that there could easily be mass effects going on, right? So you, you could be looking at the, uh, a species-rich assemblage where half of those species they're there because they arrived there, not because of local conditions. Uh -huh. So certainly that happens. Uh, but to your other question, uh, that that's why I think that lumpy coexistence should be the default framework of understanding and not niche theory. So those, those niche models, um, it is competition that, that is driving what you see. But in a lumpy model, it's both competition and neutrality. So, so just because you have a bunch of species, it doesn't mean that the competitive interactions between them is intense. Uh, this framework allows those kinds of questions to be explored. Now, the, how I defined the life history traits, it was based on maximum growth rates, and then it was based on half saturation coefficients of nutrient limiting growth. Those are very difficult to measure, <laughs> right? So, so, so that's why when Rika did the field analysis, uh, she was using body size as a proxy for competitive ability, and that is easy to do. Um, it, it, and there's a whole bunch of errors, but, but it's something, right? So, so I, I guess what I'm saying, Lee, is that it, that's a good question, point well taken, um, and I'm not sure how you would get at that easily. The, the, the framework of this model allows exploration of that, but quantifying what the model says with the complex assemblage that you see in the field, is a, that's the challenge. We, we have technologies now where you can you know, stream water through um, a hybrid flow cytometer, you know, get them in a laminar flow or flows a particle at a time. You can take a picture of it. And then the software is advanced to such a stage where um, it'll determine what the morphology is and give you an approximation of what the best species would be based on morphology. So it's, it's pretty sweet and expensive, though. But. I think we'll call it there. Thank you, Dave. Um, announcement you're going to do with the beer? You have to tell me where it's at.